Welcome to the Rock Music Alliance interview sessions. I'm your host, Cole Coleman, along with Claudio Pesavento from Mahogany Rush and the Chris Squire Band. On our show today, you know his mixing and production from so many artists he's worked with, including Van Halen, Aerosmith, Kiss, NXS, Buck Cherry, Hailstorm, Daughtry, and many, many, many more, including recently Edge of Paradise and Crossbones Skelly. Uh, that's uh, Tommy Henriksen's band, who's from Alice Cooper and the Hollywood Vampires. Welcome to our show, producer Mike Plodnikoff. Hey, how you guys all doing out there? We're doing fine over here, Mike. It's great to have you on our show. Thanks, thanks for coming on. Uh, Mike, what is your current and most interesting project that's going on? Ooh, well, there's so many. You know, I hate to like, because they're, they're all interesting, I don't like to leave anybody out. But I guess what I just finished is a new in flames album which we just finished it's going to be uh they're going to release an ep in between records or in between like full albums so i just finished that at, uh i guess end of, be, middle of november and also a new project i'm working with called silos uh a kid named ray garrison and it's his band and uh, signed to howard benson's label judge and jury howard benson and neil sanderson from three days gray so just did that record. We just pretty much finished it. I did vocals yesterday for that. We had some guest vocals on it. So I was working on that. And I think that's the last song to go on the record. It just needs to be mixed. And they've released a couple singles already. So that's it. And then uh, probably going to do a new King record. I'm not sure. Probably start that in the new year. And that's what I have up and coming. And then uh, speaking of Edge of Paradise, I'm in the studio on Monday with Margarita. She's doing I don't think it's Edge of Paradise. I think she told me she's singing on somebody else's record. Not sure whose, but she wants me to produce the vocals for it. So that's kind of where I'm at right now. You know? Right, right. She's um, she's been doing, I noticed, a fair amount of, of uh, cover stuff. Um, you know, uh, she's been uh, reinterpreting and doing the Edge of Paradise versions of, of other people's stuff. Uh, I guess it's only natural that eventually people start inviting her to sing on their records, you know. Yeah, she's been getting a lot. And I think, you know, she's very personable and very likable. So she's done a lot. I used her on the new OTEP record. She she did all the background vocals on the new OTEP record I just finished, uh, which I think it just came out not long ago, maybe the summertime. And then, yeah, she's been doing guest vocals on other projects. You know, people want a female or a, a female artist or a guest spot, and they've been asking Margarita to do it. Yeah, I got to mention for anybody watching, go check out Edge of Paradise. This is um, one of the more unique voices, I think, in 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 rock in general, but certainly in current rock. You know, I, I think she's terrific and and it's so and very unusual, unusual. She's really singing in the stratosphere a lot of the time, you know. She's amazing and she's super musical, comes up with really interesting parts, very musical. She's super talented. Yeah, I really like working with her. I, you know, I think, what is this? I'm on... I've done th three full records with Edge of Paradise, and then I did an EP with them where I first met him, and that's how I, you know, we built a relationship and started working. But yeah, I really like them. I think they're super interesting and uh, very. She's from another dimension. Yeah, she's from another dimension, exactly, and just all around, just all around good people and really fun to work with and make records with, and very creative. It's really fun being in the studio with them. We just have a great time and we're just open to everything, you know, and the creativity with them because yeah. they're always willing to experiment and try things. So it's really fun. You're, you're, we're not, you're not put in the box, so to speak, you know, where it has to be in a certain line. She's, she's always willing to try things and, and, you know, step outside the, the box, I guess you could say. Right. And she's a, a quite an accomplished uh, piano player as well. Oh yeah. Super classical trained and just a great ear for music and really good writing and, you know, she's a great producer herself. She comes in with the tracks, but a lot of them produced that she does is, you know, just writing string parts and everything. She, yeah, yeah, a lot of fun working with her. Terrific, terrific. Um, you know, speaking of, of Edge of Paradise, um, yeah, I wanted to mention, uh, yeah, we know that you've been working with them this past year on their album Hologram. Uh, I love your work with uh, Edge of Paradise. Uh, you can hear like layers upon layers of stuff going on in their in their in their music. I call it three dimensional production. You know, songs like uh, "Soldiers of Danger" and "The uh, Basilisk." You know, yeah. um, uh, is that a, is that a particular production style that you like working in as well? Or you mentioned 
that you're you're able to do that stuff with Edge of Paradise. You know, other people do they want things you know more simply done? Yeah, you know, it's a like I tailor for each each project. You know, it's like I try to get the best out of out of the project I'm working on because yeah, like when I just finished an In Flames record, they don't want all that stuff. It's just really guitars, drums get the performance, get the sounds and tones. So it's a little more simpler, you know, even like you mentioned Crossbone Scully for that record. We, you know, when Tommy talked to me, cause I did the Hollywood vampires record and you know, he, he just want, we want, we came in the studio and go, let's make an ACDC back in black. He liked the Buck Cherry record I did, you know, and after working on the vampires with him, Tommy and I just got along. So we got off tour and he goes, let's go in and make a, you know, try this record, you know, we'll make it sound like back in black, like ACDC throwback. So that's why we kind of went in and did. And that's why the record turned out. It did with Edge of Paradise, you know, Margarita loves all the strings and she likes that kind of layering. So that's what we work on. So I, yeah, I try to tailor to each project. I'm never, go, you know, I, I never try to just go, this is the way it has to be. It's like, what, what, what's the artist? Like I think of myself as the painter. If somebody brings their car into paint, even though I could do a great flame job, if they don't want a flame job, I'm not going to give them a flame job. If they just want a flat black, I'll do the best flat black. But if they want a flame job, then I'll give them a flame job. Yeah, that's awesome, man. Uh, <laughs> yeah, uh, Crossbone Scully is sounding great to me as, as well. I, I'm enjoying the song uh, uh, I'm Unbreakable. Yeah. And, uh, yeah. And I got to say, you nail it right on the head. It's like, it, it's, it's like a blend to me. It's like a blend between ACDC and Def Leppard, you know, roll into one. Well, that's exactly like it is. Do you know the full story behind that record? Oh, no. Tell us, tell us. Okay. So Tommy and I came in and we started tracking the record and we, I, we did the first 10 songs and it was during COVID over COVID we were working and he would, when he was on tour with Alice, he would come, you know, book time here in LA, we'd come and do, do some tracking and after we did i think the first 10 songs his friend goes man you guys like really nailed this acdc vibe it's like it's right on he goes my friend is mutt lang he goes i'm gonna play for mutt and tommy's going oh yeah right blah 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 so his friend sent it to, to, to mutt and mutt called tommy literally a day later and goes like you guys nailed this this is like this is he goes i want to work on it Oh, and, wow. Tommy, and Tommy goes, well, I can't afford to pay you. It's like, you know, you're Mutt Lang. And he goes, no, he goes like, I'm retired. He goes, I, I just want to work on it because it's such a good record. Wow. So send me the tracks. And, and that's why it sounds like that. Then Mutt went and put, you know, did his production on it, did all the background vocals and all the, all the stuff. So that's why it sounds like it does too. That's why it went to that next level. Wow. Yeah. It sounds great. But you, you've, you've checked it out, Claudio. You've been checking that out. Yeah. I'm yeah, like yeah. Child. All this stuff. <laughs> the, the whole record is amazing, and so we ended up recording fifty songs. There's, there's four, there's four records, and every song we did is amazing. Every song is a is a smash hit on that record. Wow! And it was just, it, it was like so much fun working with it. And Tommy's such a great guy, and I love Tommy. He's, yeah, he's a great guy. He's just he's... an amazing guy. So we we just get along, and and we have the exact same taste in the studio. So it's so much fun, you know, it was so much fun making that record. Yeah. And I think it's just, it sounds incredible. It's, yeah. yeah like you mentioned, sometimes... you mentioned 50 songs. You guys recorded 50 songs, 50 songs. <laughs> wow. Oh, and man. we did it over two years, over a two year period during the pandemic. During the pand we uh, started a little yeah. before the pandemic and then all through the pandemic and, and you know into 20 you know what was that we started i think in in the in the fall of uh 20 2019 yeah just before the pandemic hit and then we worked all through the pandemic just different times you'd come out here and then we just kept doing it and then uh yeah and then i played it for alan kovac and then we we had the record done and and like tommy didn't really know what to do with it so I said, well, you know what, let me, cause I'm, you know, I, I have a long relationship with Alan Kovac. I thought, let me play it for him. This would be like right up his alley, you know? So I sent it to Alan Kovac actually on a Saturday morning. I didn't even think he would call me. I just said, Hey, Alan, check this band out. I didn't tell him anything about it. I just, you know, I just finished this project. Let me know what you think. It was literally, I went 
got in my car. I, w- I didn't even say it was only a couple of hours. And he called me back. And I said, dude, what is this stuff? This is this is amazing. Like, who is this? Is, is it like 20? You know, he didn't uh-huh. know who this band is. How, how did I not hear them? I go, he goes, who are they? I go, well, it's Crossbone Scully. I go, but I got to tell you, Alan, it's not what you think. It's not like some some 20 year old kids. And he goes, well, who is it? Because this is and I go, well, it's Tommy Henriksen. It's from, you know, the guitar player from Alice in Chains. And actually, Mutt Lang worked on it. And then Alan basically signed it pretty okay. much on, pretty much on the spot on my, you know, let's do a phone call meeting with Tommy on Monday when I get to the office. And so basically, I hung up from uh, Alan and called Tommy and said, yeah, you know, Alan loves this stuff. He, he wants to have a meeting, you know, a phone call meeting. So we all hopped on a call on Monday morning and that was it you know basically signed pretty much signed him on the spot well i mean it's it's like to me to me it'd be like a no-brainer i mean you know tommy's already a star you know so yeah. he's, he's world known so it's it's a chance to sign up an already existing star with with built-in uh, you know uh following so awesome yeah. score yeah. score so major was, <laughs> yeah so it was, it was just fun that you know because and two we we're when we were making the record, when we first started out, we were like, ta- you know, both Tommy and I are huge Mutt Lang fans. So we're going like, oh, yeah. And like, <laughs> so we we're comparing ACDC and I always had back in black playing on loop. So I'd always be a we we're always a being going back and forth between what we were tracking and and ACDC back in black and going, yeah, we're pretty close. This is really good, you know. And <laughs> Yeah. Well, and, and were you listening? Were you listening to Def Leppard as well? I mean, because no, was... we didn't listen to Def Leppard. But when it came back for Mutt, Mutt really added the Def Leppard. It wasn't oh, okay. Def Leppard. De- Mutt really put that Def the Leppard. Vocals. Yeah, the vocals, the vocal production, the harmonies, then the way the drums basically was more Def Leppard drums. It's a combination of Def Leppard meets ACDC. But that's Mutt, and it was just like, wow, this is like amazing. Like when it came back. The stuff Mutt did, I'm just going like. And he lives in Switzerland. Yeah, yeah, yeah. he lives in Switzerland. Uh, Tommy's from Switzerland, so yeah. yeah, he's he's living there now, and it was just yeah, it was it was just so much fun. It was like almost a dream come true. You know, I I did work with Mutt long time ago with Brian Adams. So back in the '90s, I worked on some stuff with with Mutt. So I I, I did have a relationship, and he totally remembered me from you know back then working. You know, uh, so like probably like '96 was the last time I worked with him and then this is and then happened to hook up again on this crossbone scully record it's great and, and it, just like you were talking about earlier uh you know about the uh people using you know tracks to to bring the production to life tommy if you're listening <clears throat> you're gonna have to get those vocals live man <laughs> yeah <clears throat> all that know. that's those layers and stacks of vocals yeah it's just amazing it's just such a it was so fun and then just listening to the finished product on it after it, went through mud it was just like wow it was like it's one it's a record that i'm super proud of like that you hear in your head that you always want to make and it turns out sounding like that that's one of them oh it's going to be fun Uh, i'm just just thinking you know picturing you know the music i'm hearing it from crossbone scully and given you know tommy's personality that's going to be a really fun band and it's it's going to be a great live presentation i'm sure you know uh, you, you guys you tracked uh is it Tommy on guitar only in the studio or did you know uh, uh, Tommy D- Denander played some of the guitar as well like Tommy sent him the tracks and he added guitar tracks as well who Tommy Deander you know? uh, yeah, yeah, yeah yeah so he he played he played a lot of this stuff too which he just did at his his home so yeah yeah because uh, um he's got a, a great young rising star in his band uh-huh. you know, called uh, Sam Bam Colton I was just wondering if Sam, you know, got to uh, do some recording. Mm, I don't know. He's on the he's on the video. Yeah, the music yeah. video. Yeah, have you heard of him yet? Uh, have you heard of uh, Sam yet? No. Oh, okay. Yeah. Well, let me let me mention him again. His name is Sam Colton. He's 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 known on the scene a lot as Sam Bam, and he's the guitar player for several people right now. He's he's the guitar player for Dorothy. Okay. Uh, and he's the guitar player for you know Crossbone Skelly. And a local band in LA called Butterside, and uh, he sometimes sits in with uh, Jason Charles Miller at live gigs. You know, okay. a, a buddy of his plays guitar, so he's he's one of the truly a rising star on guitar right now. Very, he's a young guy. He's a young guy too. I think he's only like twenty six around something like that. Okay, yeah, I don't think he played on any of the tracks. Uh, I think Tommy probably got him after the fact when he's putting the band together because he was 
Yeah, for the, for the music video. Yeah, for the music video on the band. And I know he got Tuesday on drums, which I've known Tuesday for a while. And then the other guitar player, Anna. Yeah, but it's great. Um, in, in a way, you know, Tommy is is uh, following in the, in the steps of Alice Cooper, where, you know, he's he's got his young hotshot star of tomorrow in yeah. his band, you know? Yeah, and it looks good. It gives it, it, gives it a good image, right? Because you don't want just a bunch of old dudes playing, you know, yeah, you know, get to that that kind of music. So it makes it fun. It like I think he did a really good job of putting the band together. Well, that was Snapchat. You look young, anyway. Exactly. <laughs> Put yeah. some young, young, good-looking girls in your band, and it looks good. And and Tuesday's a great drummer. And yeah, yeah, yeah. So it's like it's like I think the band looks really good. I think the videos look great. I think it's like a really good look. So yeah, yeah. Oh, it's going to be a great band. There's no doubt in my mind. That's that's going to be a fun band. And I, I, it wouldn't surprise me at all if uh, Johnny Depp steps in here and there to, to jam on a tune. Oh, I'm sure he will. I'm sure he will. That, that'll be a lot of fun. Yeah. Well, uh, you have worked with so many great guitar players, you know, including, you know, classic rock guitar players like ACDC's Angus Young and Eddie Van Halen. So what can you tell us about recording their guitar sound and recording guitar in general? Well, with, you know, working with Eddie, and Angus Young and the and the more classic guitar players, they have it. They already have their tone, so they know what they want. And when they set up in the live room, whatever's coming out of their amp, that's you need to create that through the speakers. So they don't want any variation to that sound. They've worked their whole life to come up with their tone and their sound. And I, I need to make sure I capture what's coming out of the speaker in the room, what they've been used to for years and years of playing. When I work with newer artists, it's more like, let's create our own guitar tone as we go. So they're both difficult in a way, because when you're trying to create something new or, you know, nobody knows what, what are we even creating? What are we going for? So we're just kind of, you know, uh, shooting in the dark, I guess, so to speak, but, you know, because we don't know what, what we're really looking for. It's, it's a little bit of trial and error and, until we stumble upon something where Angus and Eddie come in and they got their tone. So I need to make sure that when they come in the control room and they're listening through the speakers, they're getting that same feel and that same vibe as mm -hmm. when they're standing next to their guitar amp. And if there's any variation, they're going, well, why doesn't it sound like where's the low ends different or the mid range different or the high? It's too bright. Or, so, you, you know, same when I worked with Carlos Santana, he's very picky on yeah, he's gone. what mic and what tone. If it's a little too bright or he thinks it's a little too buzz saw or too much fuzz on it, like he'll freak out. Like what's going on where like a newer artist will go, oh, it's like a little bit. Yeah, there's some fuzz on it. That's kind of cool, you, you know, and they'll go with that. They'll go. So then you go, okay, that's everybody thinks that's a cool sound. Let's go with that, you know, or that distortion. But for the classic guys, they want they know exactly what they want to hear to every frequency from the bottom all the way to the top. So if you're missing any low mids or got a little too much high mids or too much top, whatever it is, they're on you like no this is not right so you have to make sure your mic placement is right where the room is what your you know preamp you're using eq if any compression whatever you're using on their guitar amp they want it they want it natural organic exactly like it's how they feel it in the room when they're playing so do you like to more, record uh guitars in in a really dead room or do you like a little bit of room sound it it varies for rhythm guitars if it's just rhythm and and heavy guitars like more like marshalls through a four by twelve i like it more tight and dead so it's very more present if i'm recording combo amps i like a little bit more space how so about if I'm doing ac 30s or like old uh fenders or gibson you know gibson combo amps or you know uh uh off the top of my head you know watkins or whatever i use you know yeah I like i like the space a little more room sound just to give it a little bit of life but rhythm guitars heavy rhythms are, are fairly tight any uh any special mics that you uh, prefer 
You know what? I use, I'm very simple. It's pretty much a 57 and a 421. And, and that's all really I use. And, you know, when I record, even when I recorded Van Halen, Eddie was like just a 57. And I, I'm never, nobody ever complains about my guitar sound. You know, people try different mics and, but for me, 57 always works. I never get into trouble. It, it always passes. I never get people coming back. Oh, the guitar sounds not working. Blah, blah, blah. So if I just stay with my 57, I know it works. I know it works for me. And that's pretty much what I stay with. Every now and then I'll add a little 421 or, you know, if I'm doing a guitar solo, maybe just change the blend of the mics a little bit. If I'm using combo amps, I will use like a Royer or, uh, you know, maybe a C24 or C12 on it or U47, some vintage mics. But, you know, I, 57 just works for me and I just stay with it and it, it hasn't it hasn't proved me wrong yet so yeah until... it's, am, it's amazing to hear that really because yeah you know, just think of i mean a sure 57 you know just the old tried and true right yeah it's tried and true and like it's like a running shoe like if it works why reinvent it and it always captures the right sound it just has the right mid-range it has enough bottom i never have to eq the mic it's you know if i use like other mics will pick up more stuff but then you start getting like mm, like the low mids are a little too much and then yeah. you when you start having to mix it's then you start having to eq and once you start having to eq your guitar sounds too much then it's like starts you know you're introducing phase into the sound and so i just try to stay away from that unless there's something that we're really trying to go for differently but if i'm just really going for the basics the 57 just always works it just has the right right amount of bottom right amount of mid the right amount of top i don't have to add any eq to it so if, if 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 the sound is not there with the mic, then it's the amp. Then I know like, okay, I have to add a little bit more to the amp rather than I go, well, I got to insert an EQ now. And I, I just don't want to do that with guitar sounds. How about some of the more current or, you know, modern guitar sounds where there's like just so much, you know, beefy chunk in it, you know, does the 57 still capture that? It doesn't, but I think a lot of that is added after the fact, you know, in in the mix and they're added with plugins. Yeah. So if I'm just recording, uh, you know, the basic what I'm doing with real guitars is the 57 gets all that. If I want that more modern stuff with all that bottom, then I got to start adding plugins and that comes more, more in, in, yeah, in the EQ and the mixing then. A lot of that stuff is added. Right. And, and, so. uh, what's that, Claudio? He has a Neve. A Neve console. Ah, yeah. yeah okay. Right there. Yeah, there you go. <clears throat> it's a beautiful that thing. Helps. Yep. <laughs> uh, yeah, I was going to mention. Uh, so, and we're currently at the moment in time when amp modelers have become so good. You know, do you find yourself recording, you know, with amp modelers as much or even more than amps? No. So everybody that comes to me, he has so many amps in here. Yeah, everybody that comes to me really want. They don't want to use the modelers because everybody has it. So they still come to me because they want to use the real stuff. They want real drums. They want real bass guitar, real bass amps, real guitar amps. They want to stay away from that. Now, if we need to add to it in the mix or they feel at the end of the project, the guitars just aren't there, then we'll, I record a DI with everything I do. So then we could start reamping stuff later, but they like in flame. They want to use the real stuff. They go, listen, yeah. I can make a record at home if I want. I could just sit in my basement and use all the amp modelers, but they don't want to do that. And now they don't want to sound like everybody else. The thing is that the amps are always going to sound a little bit different. Every day you come in, depending on the power, the electricity, whatever, they just, you know, they move air differently. The modelers don't really move the air like an amp does. You don't capture that those harmonics that you get from a real amp. And so the artists I'm working with still want, want that. Yes. Now they, they might want later on, like I said, in, in, in the mix stage where, Hey, listen, we need to sound just a little bit more modern. So let's add something with, with the plugins on the DI and, and go from there. But like, yeah, so that's why I recorded DI with no matter what, even if I do like a, you know, a feedback guitar i still record a di with everything i do there's always a di recorded with every track sounds like good advice good advice yeah. 
Yeah. Of the amp modelers out there, do you have a preference that you would work with? You know, Kemper, Fractal, Neural? Uh, I like the, so I use my STL. I have a plugin with Howard Benson. I don't know if you know, it's from STL Tones. So I use that one a lot, which we modeled after all our amps and it's, it's good. And then I like the Neural DSP. So those are, those are really my go-tos on them, but I try to stay with, you know, my STL Tones one or the Neural DSP. Yeah, I was I was curious about drums. You mentioned drums, and uh, that that was where I was going next. Was <clears throat> you know with uh, with drums, there's such great sounding uh, sample libraries these days. You know, do you find yourself triggering sample libraries more than recording the real thing? But but you mentioned uh, a lot of people you know like recording. So well, what, what do you think? Well, I, again, I'm using samples with everything, but still, again, the stuff I'm doing, they they really don't want that. They want to stay as organic as possible like beefing up a little bit so there's a little bit of sample underneath but they want all the real tones and that's why people still come to me they want the real drums uh the real instrumentation yes if we got to beef it up let's add a little bit of a sample underneath the snare and a little bit under the kick and that's really it just to you know tighten it up a little bit give a little more weight but it's pretty much the real drums i would say it would be maybe uh anywhere between us 60 40 70 30 uh mix of i'd say more 60 40 probably real to sample ratio well it sounds great no doubt about that like i said i love your recordings you know uh what do you think claudio do you do you, uh you like using samples uh, yeah, or... he, yeah and only he have if you go in the back on the in the live room he has so many amps like any amps that you want to ever seen in your life they're there and you got something here too. I'll show you around after the interview. I'll walk yeah, that'd you be, around. That'd be great. That'd be great. We'll be right back after a word from our sponsor. Attention guitar players, join the Thimble Slide revolution and free your slide finger. The Thimble Slide is a mini guitar slide designed to be worn on the tip of your finger, about three quarters of the way down your fingernail. When worn there, you can still bend your finger. And most importantly, it's allowing enough of your fingertip through so you can press the guitar strings. The thimble slide is larger at the back and smaller at the front, so it follows the contour of your finger. So when you're wearing the slide, it's not loose or rattling around on your fingertip. This also allows your other fingertips in nice and close for playing. The sizing gap allows you to make the slide a little bit larger or a little bit smaller for a nice custom fit. So while you're wearing a thimble slide, you can, of course, use it as a slide. But more importantly, it allows you to still fret the strings so you can play the guitar. You can play chords. You can play lines while wearing it. strings with your ring finger. You can drag your fingertip across the strings if you need to. You can do pull-offs, hammer-ons. So there you go. You can actually still really do all the things you need to do to keep playing guitars like that. With its patented shape, you can slide and fret while wearing the thimble slide. Visit thimbleslide.com. That's thimbleslide.com. You know, Mike, when I was uh, reading up on you, uh, I didn't see a lot on the web about your early background. If you would, you know, take us back to your beginnings and tell us, you know, where were you born and raised? So I was born and raised in a small town in British Columbia, Canada called Grand Forks. Uh, it's basically a border town. We, I lived right on the uh, Washington state border. So people, you know, in America are listening to this. If you were to go to Spokane, Washington and drive basically two hours north, you would hit the border and you would hit Grand Forks, BC. And that's where I grew up. Uh, then after I finished high school, I moved to Vancouver with my I've been with my wife since I was 15. So we've been together since we were in the 10th grade. 
we packed up. I wanted to be a recording engineer and we finished high school and we moved to Vancouver. And then I started, I got a, started working at Little Mountain Sound, which was obviously with Bruce Fairburn and Bob Rock. So that's where I started. So I was, you know, started out as a runner at the studio answering phones, but slowly worked my way up to be an assistant engineer and then you know, worked on with Bruce on Aerosmith and then was his engineer and then did three Cranberries records with him and in excess and the yes records and ACDC. So that's where I started. And then, uh, Bruce passed away in 1999. We were in the middle of a yes record. Yeah. And, uh, I just started to mix the record. We just finished tracking. I was the first day of mixing and you know, I didn't even get through the first mix and Bruce passed away. I ended up finishing the Yes record and then things kind of slowed down because for 10 years I was always uh, relying on Bruce. You know, we do three records a year, pretty much from September to May or June. And then we take the summers off. So we'd been, you know, do an Aerosmith record and then go into a Van Halen record and a Kiss record. So I did all those records with Bruce. Then he, when he passed away, I really had nothing. It really slowed down. And then my friend Reese Fulber, who I mixed a delirium record for him. And Reese is also a producer from Vancouver. And he was in Frontline Assembly, great programmer, had these delirium records. And he produced, or I, I mixed this song called Silence for Delirium with, with Sarah McLaughlin on it. And it turned out to be a huge hit all over the world. Right. I remember that. I love that, that, that track. That yeah, yeah. I love that track. So, yeah. So anyways, things weren't really started stagnating, you know, were stagnant after Bruce passed away. And David Foster was producing a Josh Groban record. And he called up Reese and said, hey, like, I love Josh loves that one song silence that you did with him i want you to do like two songs for josh groban that are in that vein on the record even though it's 12 songs so reese goes well i need mike to do it you know because mike was really a big part of that and mixing so i want to bring mike down to la with me and do this do this these two songs with josh so i came down to la and this was in 2000 and we finished that and then reese who had produced uh a couple of fear factory records after was going to do the Fear Factory record, Digimortal. And he goes, well, Mike, why don't you stay in LA with me and do Digimortal with me? So I ended up recording and mixing the Digimortal record for Fear Factory. And then I met his manager, Aaliyah Fallberg, who was uh, with Network. And she loved the record. And she goes, you know what? I got to play it for this producer I managed named Howard Benson because he really needs an engineer. He does, he he has these other engineers, but his records aren't. He's a great producer, but his records don't sound great because he's never had a really good engineer. So he's, mm. he so he introduced me to Howard and I had a meeting with Howard and we, we got along after the first meeting, you know, and he goes, well, he goes, yeah, maybe I'll try you out on a record. So nothing really happened. I went back to Vancouver, finished the Fear Factory record. And literally a month later, I got a call from Aliyah and goes, you know, Howard's going to produce this record on Revly, a, a, a record on Electra Records, this band called Revly. Uh, and he just wants you to come down and just record the drums, uh, drums, bass and guitars on it. And he'll finish the rest. He'll do the vocals and blah, blah, blah. So anyways, I came down to L.A. for a couple of weeks, tracked just the drums, basic rhythms and bass, and then went back to Vancouver, did some rough mixes for them and went back to Vancouver. Nothing then. I'm doing some small projects in Vancouver. And then Aaliyah called me back and goes, you know, they really like your rough mixes. You want to come back and mix the album? So I said, sure. So I ended up flying back to LA and, and uh, mixed the record and it turned out, turned out really good at the time. And then Howard asked me, he goes, well, why, I'm doing this other record on Atlantic records named Brad Kane. So he goes, you want to stay and do it? So I said, sure. So I ended up staying, finishing the whole record with Howard I think this was like the summer of or the spring of 2001. And after I finished the record, he goes, well, I have good news. And he already knew I was in L.A. for quite a while. He goes, well, I got good news and bad news. And I go, well, what's the what's the good news? He goes, well, I have another record coming up. And he goes, well, I go, what's the bad news? He goes, well, you won't be able to go home. Uh -huh. So I'm going like, oh, so I called my wife and I go, listen, I go, OK, 
I go, I don't think I'm coming home. I go, <laughs> maybe we should think of moving to LA. And she goes, okay. And we ended up selling our house in Vancouver and I moved to LA and then Howard and I just went on this run for, and I'm still working with Howard, you know, it's like him and I now Howard has his own label and obviously he signed, uh, edge of paradise is partly on judge and jury records which is howard's record and yeah so and we're still going to get together we did the in flames record together and uh, so that's kind of where yeah it's you know that's a I great story a, good, a great story of your of your life you know and uh yeah, yeah I'm, I'm glad howard found you yeah yeah so it's great and we're still making records together and uh yeah still going and still love doing it you know it's still like you know i can't believe i get this is what i get to do for a living and I get to do this and we worked with so many great artists, but yeah. So that's where I came from, you know, basically Grand Forks to Vancouver to LA. Yeah. That's awesome. Um, yeah. You mentioned, of course, uh, I guess you would call him your mentor, probably uh, your mentor, uh, you know, Bruce Fair, Fairbairn. Yeah. Fairbairn. Right? And I wanted to mention to the, uh, anybody listening, uh, you know, for our listeners, Bruce Fairbairn was a legendary Canadian producer whose credits include uh, Bon Jovi's Slippery When Wet Aerosmith's Permanent Vacation, Pump, and Get a Grip albums, uh, Kiss, Psycho Service, and you know many, many more, including his final work, as Mike mentioned, on Yes's album, The Latter. Correct. And he yeah. was working with Bob, Bob Rock, right? Yeah, and I worked with Bob, not very often, but very in the very beginning, I did, like the first record I, I worked on with Bob was the greatest hits record for Cher. And that's basically how I got in because I was answering phones. I just started answering phones at Little Mountain. And it, it was pretty much the fall of, I guess, 1990. I was working at this other studio, yeah, 89 or 90. And nobody wanted to work over the Christmas holidays. It came up to Christmas and I was just answering phones. Mm -hmm. And Bob was going to come in and do a Greatest Hits record, three songs for Cher on a Greatest Hits record. And I'm going out of work and Bob's looking at me going like, no, you know, like you're, who are you? You're just some kid answering phones. <laughs> and then finally he couldn't get anybody. And he looked at me and goes, okay, you're, you know, you're doing it, but you know, don't mess up. <laughs> and Mike Fraser was the engineer oh, on, yeah. on the, on the, on the record. So I was the assistant and I went in there and because prior to that, prior to that, even though I was answering phones, I would come in early to the studio and, spent then i wouldn't leave at night when everybody left i would take a boom box into the studio and mic it up and learn how all the gear worked what every mic did what it sounded like so when i was ready to get my chance i knew what everything did so they were really impressed and then we finished that record and then bruce was coming in to do a live record with acdc it was wow. basically they recorded all the it was donnington acdc at donnington the live oh, yeah, record. yeah all over I so yeah so all those all those, those tapes came in and then mike or bob and bruce, or mike fraser and bob rock both told bruce yeah use mike on it he was like really good on it so that's why bruce tried me out as the assistant and then i basically was the assistant on that record and then the end of get a grip is when i kind of he had me engineer the last little bit of get a grip and that was my first kind of record that i engineered uh part of the record and obviously turned and then basically i was his engineer for the next 10 years on all the van halen and like i said cranberries yes kiss in excess um i don't know what else scorpions all these other records that i did with him for 10 years until he passed away and then but yeah, Bruce is amazing. And uh, it was fun because we got to travel all over the world making records, like doing the Cranberries records in Ireland and in excess in Spain. And we were just, we did records everywhere. So it was a lot of, and he was amazing. Bruce is just so talented as a musician. And he just understood production and songs and writing. A lot that, like Howard Benson is too. Like I got to work with these great guys that really understand the songs and you know, they don't get wrapped up in the weeds of production. It's like all about getting the best song. Yeah. Uh, yeah. We know we just have time for a couple more questions, but I did want to touch on one very interesting thing. Uh, fascinatingly, I've heard that you have synesthesia, you know, the, the condition where you uh, see colors while hearing oh, music. Yeah. Who you know, told you that? Oh, it's just my, my little ways. You know, I find, I find stuff out, uh, you know, it, now is that true? And, that is. And, that does is. It, and does it help you in your mixing? absolutely because and you know what i didn't really know i had it I, it started out 
like long, when I first started mixing, like I noticed that I could see things like I really knew where the symbol should sit. I could just see it. So I always pictured like a, just a live band, like what you would think very generic, you know, Oh, here's where the cymbal sits. Here's where the hi-hat sits and, you know, the guitars. And I could picture everything on stage so I could place it. Like it's, it's very visual more than, more than listening. Like if I look at the speakers, so a lot of times, like I'll even mix backwards because I don't like looking at the speakers because I see everything. So as time started progressing, started noticing it more. And then I, I started going like, I don't know. I just started thinking about, I didn't even know what it was called or a symptom. I'm just going like, hmm, it always works, you know? And then just in my head, you know, like, you know, you just talk to yourself and I would go like, hmm, like, what if I do this? And then I started going, well, what? And then later on, just like messing around, I thought, well, what if I saw like an apple tree? And then I would look out the window and picture an apple tree and go, well, what if I painted an apple tree? Like, let me just do like, what if it was red over here? Cause I see red, it looks red to me. I don't even know if it's true because <laughs> so I would do these stupid things just in my head. And then when the people would listen to it, they would get a vision too. Like, Oh man, when I listen to that song, like I picture myself like on a boat on like a storm coming. So I would get beginning, even though that's not at all what I envisioned, I'm going like I was envisioning an apple tree in my backyard. Wow. So I started doing and then just started like really working on it. I'm going, huh, that's interesting. So then when I would mix and then I would like some days, like I, I just don't see anything. It's, and I would struggle on a mix and just like, I don't know, is the kick loud enough? Or is like, what, is, what am I supposed to be doing? And the mixes were always, they would never pass and would be, you know, just, an, you know, pulling teeth to try to get, you know, get this mix finished, you know, that the band would approve or management or the record label. But every time I would see stuff, I would go like, it was pretty much always perfect. I never really had any comments of the mix. So this started going, then I started going, well, let me picture like an alien spaceship. What if I mixed and, you know, there'd be blue lights here and I could picture the blue. And then it started going like, huh, like, yeah. That's, I, that's for Margarita. Yeah, I could see a space, I could see a spaceship or whatever. Yeah, I was, I was just, so just going to say a uh, Margarita Monet would love that, right? <laughs> yeah, well, I, I've talked to her many times about it. So then it started getting, and then, you know, I started listening to more music, and then I started, you know, like, I'm a huge Pink Floyd fan, and I go, man, like, I could really see the colors in Pink Floyd. Like, these people have what I'm seeing because I see the pictures clearly. Like, like this is no accident that Pink Floyd is doing what they're doing, or Massive Attack, or if I listen to anything yeah. Spike Stent mixed, I would go, wow, like he, he must have this too, what I have, because this is not a mistake. Cause I listen to other music and it's just, you know, it, it's good, but it doesn't have these images that certain people have in their, in their production. And I'm going like, wow, like, I don't know if I've never talked to them about it, but I'm going, when I listen to these records, they have this imaging, same with mud. If I listen to ACDC or any of the ACDC, there's this imaging going on that cannot be by accident. So I really started really focusing on and, and honing in on it and, and would like practice. And, and then for, you know, it really started showing up probably about 15 years ago, maybe like 2005. So when I started in 1989, I just, you know, but then it really started clicking. Like I really started developing this where I could see the colors. Like I go like, Oh, like, I listened to it and, and I'm, I'm able to see these. So I started trying to incorporate it going like, is this just in my head that this is happening or is this really going on? So I kept doing it and doing it and got to a point. So now it's very like I've worked on it as a skill and it's just there. So when I do it and then I started looking at, at art. So I started mixing probably about, 10 years ago, I started pulling up like Da Vinci paintings or Monet's or, you know, all these famous, you know, Renaissance artists, Van Gogh's and trying to go, okay, like, let me look at the picture and mix and just try to copy those colors. And when I started doing that, the records started sounding like taking on a whole new life. And then I noticed that when I hand them in or send them to the artist, Everybody, oh my God, this sounds amazing. They wouldn't know it. They wouldn't know it, but I could tell by the comments that when I was like nailing this and goes, yeah, that's pretty good. Or like, you know, I have these dark shades on my windows right now, but I would take them off and look at the yard 
and kind of mix into the into the yard. Like when I mixed uh, Anita Strauss's record, who plays with Alice Cooper, it's an instrumental record. There's no vocals on it. Uh, I forget what the name of the record was called, her first instrumental. But basically all I did on the whole record and all the mixes was look outside and just mix the backyard and, and visualize the what my backyard looked like with all the trees and shrubs and flowers and, and placed everything musically like that and use that. So then I started telling somebody I was doing that and they go, oh, that sounds like you have, you know, that you see it's, it's actually a condition. There's people that have it. And then I go, oh, interesting. Okay. Yeah. Synesthesia. Yeah. Yeah, in a seat, seat, whatever. Yeah, we're going to see her tonight. Yeah, so and and then I go, oh well, maybe I do have that. Well, well Mike, that that does bring us, you know, to the end of our time. Uh, you know, people listening, you can keep in touch with Mike at mikeplotnikoff.net, and of course on social media. You know, so Mike, thanks yeah. for being our being, thanks for being our guest today on the Rock Music Alliance interview sessions. Thanks, man. Yeah, awesome. We should, we yeah. Get him back. In, in, Instagram would be the best for if you want to stay in touch with me. Like, I don't really check my mikeplotnikoff.net. I'm not really on Facebook, but uh, the really thing is is Instagram. That's what I, you know, so if anybody wants to go there, just go to Mike Plotnikoff on Instagram and that would be the best place. I'm Cole Coleman. And for Claudio Pesavento, the Rock Music Alliance, and the RMA Awards, thanks for watching and listening. Visit us at rockmusicalliance.com and check out this year's RMA Awards for rock, metal, and progressive rock music.